What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law. This is episode 82 and we're back from a very, very long break, and we are very glad you're able to join us today. They say we learn the most from our losses, and that is exactly what the show aims to do. We're going to interview a top player who has lost one to two games at a major event. We're going to break down the mistakes they made during that game, how they plan to learn from them, and how they plan to move forward with an unbroken mindset. How often have you blamed the game on bad dice? I did it not two months ago. I think I was on the episode after that. We all do it. So. We're going to debunk that today. We're going to talk about how you can learn to love the game and stop blaming dice. Now, we are heading to Toledo, Ohio today for the one, the only Glass City GT. It actually had about 67 players this year. Pretty big, sh- a pretty big turnout this year. And we are talking about Sisters of Battle playing into the dreaded, the one, the only Tau. Now, this is part one of the episode. In this part, we'll be analyzing the game, talking about common mistakes, secondaries, target priority, and all of the above. In part two, which is available to subscribers at Patreon now. That's right, Patreon. Make sure to switch your subscription over from the old website to the new Art of War Patreon. We will be talking about the list, how they plan to adjust moving forward with the new meta, how they play into your list, my list, every list above, and all of the archetypes. And of course, don't you forget the one, the only, the elite player mindset. Now, I have a new co-host today. You might know him from some of Art of War's other content. He's coming from a land down under. He is a champion down there. He is one of the members of the Australian national team that won the WTC this year. He's won a lot of events, and he will be hopefully making a splash this year at LVO. I, of course, am talking about Mr. Matt Morisoli. G'day, mate. How's it going? It's uh, it's really exciting to hop on and, you know, just uh, talk about, you know, 40K with, you know, more new people. It's always exciting. Yeah, we're trying to turn the show on its head. You know, we're on opposite sides of the world, so it's hot down there. It's cold up here. We're one eighting, one unbroken. Now we're bringing you on. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna get people a little slice of the other side of the world, man. Yeah, uh, can't wait, man. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to diving into, you know, just talk, talking about some, some new lists with some new people. It's always a good time. Now, are you gonna steal my questions? Is the question, the question uh, about the questions? The question about the questions, probably. I don't know. Am I? I don't know. I'm. I'm I'm very confused. I don't speak American, mate. Well, just buckle in. Um, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about except for you. So if you steal my question, uh, we're going to have a problem, man. So let's talk about our guest today. Our guest just had a child. It's very exciting. He is very gracious to be here with us today. He has a three-day-old kid. Congratulations again. And he has been making a big splash. He's uh, He's been playing for a little less than a year. He's been doing very well, winning some RTTs up there in the Michigan area. He finished very well with only one loss, and that one loss was to Mr. Thomas Ogden, who went on to win the event this last weekend. So I think overall, you are really kind of emerging on your own as a sisters player. I, of course, am talking about Mr. Scott Ketchum. Hey, everyone, and that's actually doctor to you. You should know better. Oh, Dr. Ketchum. Sorry, Dr. Ketchum. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Really excited. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, what drew you to sisters? I just have to ask, like, uh, you're starting the game. What was your like mindset going into it? Honestly, I think the aesthetic really drew me. I thought it was really cool. The whole, uh, Gothic. And I really liked how intricate, um, all the models were. they have a, like a fantastic new model line. I remember it was, I was just hanging out in my local games workshop store, I think a little over a year ago now, just checking out all the different lines and factions. And, um, my eye was just drawn to the, uh, the sisters lineup. And um, I, I wasn't feeling very creative, so I needed some box art to go off because it was my first army that I was getting into, and I like the red-black aesthetic. So. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's real nice. Yeah, they do have some really, like, cool, like, almost like more uh, true-scale human figures, which I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. Like, I love their just basic dudes. Like, if I could have an entire army of just base dudes, like, that would be sick. You know, I wish that Triumph was more competitive because that is a heck of a model. Oh, yeah. Carrying around this huge shrine. Yeah. Can you imagine flying that in on a space hall? Oh yeah, it'd be it'd be awesome. I really like the um, 
I guess they're pretty good now. The Paragons, the Paragon spam is kind of a cool thing also because they got those like uh, neat little suits and all that. So uh, yeah, you know, they, they, I feel like people were spamming the list with war suits and mortifiers for a while, but unfortunately, with the upcoming rules changes, they may not have the durability to put out the damage. That's very sad. We'll touch on that in part two. I definitely want to hear about what you plan on doing in the Arcs of Omen Age, um, because I know you're going to adjust a lot of stuff because this is so different. Tell me a little bit about Glass City. Let's let's just walk through it. Tell me about the terrain layout, kind of what you thought of the store and all that. Yeah, sure. Um, So this is my second time to Glass City um, for a GT. I'm coming from a little bit north in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so drives only 45 minutes. My gracious wife, uh, let me go to the tournament despite being due, um, I think, a couple days before. Um, but the, the tournament itself was great. I was a little bit nervous going in with the terrain. Most of the terrain that I had been playing on up until this point was GW format. And so I didn't have to worry about placing it myself. So this was actually my first player place terrain event. And I was worried that it might be a little bit light to hide my sisters. But uh, I, I think I learned a lot about uh, terrain placement at this event, and I can see how it could um, help sisters lean into some of their strength. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, and the terrain I think will come into play uh, against Tom here too. Did you um, did you name your child Celestine uh, since she was born right around the tournament time? Oh no, we're just it's Morvin. Yeah. Okay. Morvin's oh. all. Morvin Ball catch him. Yep. That's a heck of a name, man. Love it. Got to love it. It's Maybe talk about ball. ball. Yeah, middle name, a middle name, Evol, you know, Vol yeah. Ketchum. That'd be great. There you go. Um, yeah, so uh, I was actually at this event also, and one of the things I thought was pretty neat, had that um, that little ruin in the center, which I think is kind of crucial for player place terrain, honestly. It kind of takes a little bit of the advantage that a more uh, veteran player has because one of the problems that we've seen with player place terrain is you could have a player – like yourself even, that's kind of newer to the game and maybe has played on GW a lot. And then they go into a player place terrain setup against an Ogden or a Brad Chester or someone like that. And you make one slip on a deployment on a piece of terrain. And all of a sudden you're, uh, you know, fighting an uphill battle at the get go. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that really, uh, it really helped me, I think, going into my first player place terrain tournament and having that um, piece of terrain in the center that, you know, um, was that completely covered uh, the area that you could be in to stand on the objective, I think was really helped. It, it made it a little bit dangerous to try to take the objective against the shooting army, um, but it was also a great place to stage some melee if you didn't want to stand on the objective. So it um, it, it made it pretty fun. Yeah, it gave, it gave you options, and it kind of gives you lanes as a shooting army. It kind of gives you the jumping <laughs> off point as a melee army. So I think it's pretty fair. It takes a little bit of the advantage away and creates more of a almost a little bit more of an even playing field, I think. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Matt, how do you feel about that, about the player place terrain? Yeah, I think what you touched on before is a really good point, right? That um, if you haven't done it before, it does create like another level of skill gap. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, really competitive players will play newer players and they'll do cool little movement things and they'll get little advantages that way. But this can like really create, you know, a massive imbalance if you make mistakes during terrain placement. So I think the player place terrain is really interesting. I think you need to have the right terrain set for it. Like we're looking at, you know, for me, I'm thinking about LVO because I don't play on the FLG terrain more than once a year when I come over to LVO and I don't really get much experience playing on that terrain. Uh, It's like, well, hey, you know, you can make small mistakes with this terrain setup, give your opponent a massive firing lane because you put something too far away from something else or you put your sort of crate too close to another crate and all of a sudden there's this massive firing lane, right? So I think it's a a skill in itself that kind of needs to be developed and you need to understand, you know, what's really important and what you're trying to achieve with your terrain placement sort of before you even place one piece. Um, And for someone who's like newer to playing player place terrain, you know, there's kind of this weird little sub meta that evolves where certain things are really good on player place terrain right like units that can jump shoot jump for example like you know battle suit units that can move and shoot and then fire and fade you know eldar stuff that can fire and fade like things like that like go up in stock because you always have a perfect place to put them so i think it really just creates this like added level of complexity to the game and it's almost like an additional skill gap that you need to somewhat close as a player who's like learning how to play on this you know new sort of terrain system right i think the most important thing that i learned in the last year of playing it 
because I was new to it also. And I got back in the edition. And I think one of the most important things I noted was someone told me at one point, like actually outline, lay your terrain down and make sure you can put it where you want to put it. Because the last thing you want is to have like a big ruin left and you literally have to put it in like the worst spot possible because you don't have space for it. So I think that's pretty critical. It's kind of making an outline because it doesn't matter, right? If your back fields down, no one, it doesn't, it's not going to change what your opponent's going to do most likely. Yeah. The, the only time that ever really comes up is if you lay everything out and you put a couple of things sort of like on the line, you know, that can give your opponent a bit of information. But unlike deployment, the information you kind of gain from um, from like showing verticomers where your terrain is going to go, you kind of don't really tell your opponent all that much. You know, a lot of the time it's really intuitive a lot of the time, especially if you're playing someone who like is at the level where they could you know, somewhat counter deploy you. But they're probably going to know where you want to put most of your stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, you did mention putting a terrain piece on the line. I think that's something that I learned early. Um, that I was a little bit nervous about because you know, a lot of sisters lists depend on uh, the ability to defend the shrine every turn. And um, so I always place my first small ruin by my shrine because you can imagine if your uh, near objective is close enough to the, to the line where players are allowed to place terrain, it might be easy for an opponent to put a terrain piece right on the line and, and not be able to place my ruin on that defend the shrine objective. Um, yeah. So thankfully, we figured that one out sooner rather than later. Yeah, that can be rough, definitely. Scott, why don't you go ahead and walk us through your list? So you played Sisters of Battle. Let's hear all about them. Yeah, sure. So I took a um, Bloody Rose uh, detachment. It was a battalion. Uh, in my No Force organization slot, I had a Hospitaller and a Repentia Superior. And my HQs, I had a Canoness with the Word of the Emperor, which allows um, me to pick um, an enemy unit within three inches in the fight phase to give them fight slash. And then once per game, I can also turn off invulnerable saves in the fight phase in an aura. I That's have huge. good old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. My good old fashioned Celestine and Morgan Ball. And then I have my obligatory troop tax with three battle sister squads, um, which may change in the near future. And then in my elite slots, I have a squad of seven sacrosants, the superior having um, the halberd instead of the spear still. A couple of Crusaders, um, a Dogmata with Course of Spiritual Fortitude, and then this really fun toolkit piece, um, colloquially known as the Bonk Mata, but a Dogmata that really slaps. We can get into her maybe a little bit. And then two squads of eight sisters, Repentia, a squad of five Zephyrum, and a squad of eight Zephyrum. And then in the heavy support slots, we have two squads of Retributors, each having two Cherubs, four Multi-Meltas, and nine girls total in the squad, and then a, and a Rhino. Nice. Uh, who starts mm -hmm. in the Rhino typically for you? Is it that big uh, Retributor squad? No, so it actually is the, uh, we got 10 girls to go together. We've got seven sacrosancts, two crusaders, and the bonk mata. And um, this is a something that I put in the list that I hadn't played with at previous tournaments. I was really looking forward to trying the bonk mata. Um, and I think what this allows is the option for an alpha strike that only costs one CP to move the rhino, as opposed to having repentia in the rhino, which would cost you two CP. And then, you know, if I go first, I can consider going for an alpha strike with this rhino and some move blocking of the crusaders and the rhino itself. Or if I go second, I could, you know, take the rhino out of harm's way and, and hide it behind a rune on my near objective. And then all of a sudden I've got seven sacrosancts, a dogmata, a couple of crusaders already parked on my shrine. So nice. Nice. Love a little bit of versatility. Yeah. Uh, Matt, why don't you go ahead and tell us about uh, Tom Ogden's uh, Tau list? Yeah, man, for sure. So this is uh, a pretty interesting Tau list. It's very compact. Um, I'm sure. As Scott will tell us, it definitely still packs a punch, but there isn't a lot in it. So we've got um, Commander Shadow Sun uh, with uh, Exemplar of the Kaluan, uh, a Crit Shaper with the Advanced AM Scrambler. We've got a Cold Star Commander with Precision of the Hunter, um, all the good guns, the Burst, the Advanced Burst, the High Output Burst, and a Plasma Rifle um, with Shield Gen. Um, we have Long Strike, uh, a unit of Crit. Then we have two big crisis battle suit units. So the first one um, is five man with burst, cyclic, and plasma. There's a single shield generator in there, um, a couple of target locks, and then a guy with the stim injector uh, and the iridium battle suit uh, and three shield drones. Then the other unit is another five man with an air bursting frag, a cyclic, and a plasma each. And there are three uh, target locks in there and two shield generators. And we've got the uh, the relic upgrade um, on the uh, the airburst frag in there as well, also with three shield generators. Um, then we have a riptide with plasma ion and two sun shark bombers. So not a whole lot of stuff, but every unit you know is very very efficient. Like is is packed. 
you know, a thousand points in battle suits when you add up the crisis suits and the uh, the commander there together, um, and then like another good you know seven hundred points in a couple of sun sharks, a riptide, and long strike. But um, but it shoots very very well. I think it's a, a very good tower list. I think it's always ridiculous when you um, when you look at those sun sharks though. They're so freaking good, and um, you almost have to have that exemplar of the Kion in there because. You can just redeploy. It's like, oh well, I didn't get first turn. Let me just take these guys and uh, and move them, move them off the board or whatever you need to do. And it's just that's pretty bonkers to me. Yeah, it, it's absolutely the most obnoxious thing in the Tau Army. I, I'm I'm glad that there's a little bit of a nerf coming for flyers um, because uh, you know you can ask Jack. You can attest to this. When I played Jack at WTC this year, I spent 15 minutes in my deployment phase making sure there was not a single place those sun sharks could land in my backfield, and it didn't matter because I still got pretty much off the board in one turn anyway. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's very obnoxious those uh, those sun sharks. Boy, I got to say that sounds remarkably familiar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 we can we can share more stories later on, mate. I'm I'm very happy to. <laughs> To, you know, just sit in the corner and cry and talk about, you know, the bad things that Sun Sharks have done to us. Yeah. Well, Scott, tell us about the mission. What mission did you all play and what secondaries did you and Ogden take? Sure. Um, we played Tear Down Their Icons, which is commonly known as bombs. Um, so I took the good old fashioned sisters passive secondaries, the Leap of Faith, uh, Banners, and Defend the Shrine. And then Tom, I think, took two of his towel ones, and then uh, assassinate. Yep. What, where would you like me to go from here? So basically tell me about deployment. So when you all did the player place terrain, did you feel like you had a pretty good jumping off point? And do you feel like he deployed? Obviously, he deployed, he deployed well as, uh, there as well. But kind of walk me through that. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess let's, ta- let's start with the actual terrain. Now, the terrain was actually designed by one of the players. There was a, there was a competition at the event um, where there was a prize given away for the best terrain. Um, and so we were on a table that wasn't as standardized as the rest of the table. So it made the terrain a little bit more difficult. The ruins that I, w- that I had were a little bit smaller than on some of the other tables, which, you know, as a sisters player means I really, really, really have to be super careful about the angle that I put the ruins down. Um, because, you know, if the walls aren't as long, it's going to be a lot easier for Tom to cut angles around them. Uh, if he goes first in particular, and then, um, it also gives me a little bit less of a footprint to hide my sisters in. So I think, um, I, the, the ruins that I had, I, you know, I put, usually put one ruin, uh, near my home objective and then another ruin near the shrine, but the, it wasn't big enough. I, I need a little bit more deployment area in my own or a little bit more area in my own deployment zone to, to deploy uh, some of my army. So I, there was this big obscuring piece that was actually over by the shrine and then a couple small ruins in my deployment zone. So I had enough space to put everything down. That was kind of the first challenge. Um, and as I later realized, I don't think I cut the angle exactly where I wanted it to be. And I think I needed to be a little bit more precise because um, Tom was able to get an angle on me that I uh, didn't anticipate him getting. Um, but after that, you know, the deployment, I think the other thing that you have to take into consideration when uh, playing Tau and uh, maybe in Sisters in particular is what the heck are you going to put in your transport and strategic reserves? So um, anything that's left on the table is um, open for the taking uh, against the the bombers. I think it's usually pretty challenging to sc- screen out the entire backfield without giving Tom you know, an opening to shoot at whatever is in the backfield screening the, the, the landing zone for the bombers. So usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to cram everything into my ruins, um, let the let the bombers come behind me and try to suffer through whatever damage they'll deal, which is maybe something I need to change up moving forward. But um, the other thing that playing town makes me do a little bit differently is, like I said, for every other match, I put the Sacrosens, the Crusaders, uh, the Bonk Mata in the Rhino and use it as either a turn one, maybe mini alpha strike versus turn one, head over to the shrine and secure it against the opponent. But I don't want to spend too much CP on putting units into reserves uh, against Tau, but I also don't want to leave my Repentia vulnerable because we all know they're a pretty valuable trade piece. So I end up putting the Repentia and the Rhino, I think maybe with the Repentia Superior and the Dogmata. The other things that went into reserves was my other squad of Repentia and I think a squad of Battle Sisters, which adds up to 9 CP and can therefore only cost me 1 CP. Um, now, Tom, I think, 
uh, well, his deployment doesn't matter as much because his bombers don't have to go into strategic reserves. We all know with the exception of Morvan Ball, my threat range with my retributor is going to be 30 inches. Um, so he can just kind of tuck them back in his, in his back corner. And then um, uh, he can redeploy what he needs to in order to uh, choose a side to advance on, put pressure on. So, um, so that being said, in the ruins, I had two little small ruins in my deployment zone. I put a squad of retributors in each of them, uh, the nine girl squads. And then um, tried to tuck everything else into the rooms as best I could uh, and giving the yeah. characters protection where they needed. Tell me what happened. Uh, so what's your game plan going into this? You kind of talked about you're wanting to get on your um, get, defend your shrine. And how are you planning on kind of negating some of the damage he was going to put in on you? So I think if you do the math, um, the, the retributors are almost always going to be the, the target for the Sunshark bombers if you leave them on the table. Um, and that's somewhat intentional. And so I think here was one mistake that I, I should have changed. I, w- the one thing, you know, it's fine leaving them on the table, but I think if I want to utilize them as best I can, make sure the shoot on death is going to be valuable. And the most valuable that I can make it is if he shoots the retributors with one bomber, the retributors that shoot on death can fire at the bomber that hasn't shot yet. So, um, and I tucked my retributors in a little bit too deeply to make sure that I could get that angle. So I needed to open up my runes a little bit more so that if the, the bombers flew over my retributors, then uh, if they target one squad of retributors, it can shoot the other bomber. Um, and so sense. that's kind of one. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's a really uphill battle um, into uh, Tau double, double sun, sun shark bombers. Um, but I, I try to get squeeze the most out of the al- like whatever his alpha strike is going to do, um, include, including the shoot on death and having them within six inches of Morgan Ball. So at least if they fire on death, they're, you know, hitting on threes, re-rolling ones, wounding on threes, re-rolling ones. But you, you're also relying, you, you know, you're spending two CP and you're also relying on four ups in order for them to shoot. So um, that's kind of how I try to uh, choose my deployment for, um, uh, against Tau. And then I also leave the Hospitaller as best I can within reach of both the Retributors because, again, they're, they're likely going to be the target and the six up deal no pain isn't nothing if, right. you know, the bom- bombers are going to, kill four or five on their four ups flying over so who went first and kind of walk us through walk us through the game give us a kind of yeah, well, general like a bird's eye view on it we you know kind of yeah. uh, the general movements yeah so um tom went first and he put a lot so if you can picture it's, it's kind of a diagonal deployment and he really pressured his uh battlefield edge towards my near objective trying to stay uh at maximum range you know obviously pre-measuring where my 30 inches was from the retributors and, you know, and it became kind of less relevant as, as, as the bombers did the damage they wanted to do. So he was kind of creeping down his battlefield edge toward my shrine, trying to stay at maximum distance, but also putting in a lot of, um, putting in his own threat range. I think the, the riptide was able to sneak around the corner and get an eye on the rhino and was able to pop the rhino. I think with like the, you know, it was like the last, shots he's going to get at the rhino before he selected uh the i think it was the crisis suits to fire after that and unfortunately i just couldn't keep it alive despite smoke um you know it was like the last wound he got on it and then things started popping open and once they're open the deployment zone the way it is is was personally i thought it was kind of challenging to hide things where i needed to them needed them to be um even if they were to come out of the rhino so he was doing pretty terrible damage uh, on, on turn one. And then from there, it was an uphill battle. We did a little bit of trading back and forth on the shrine. Um, but uh, when Tao goes first on uh, a mission where I had difficulty kind of hiding my good trade pieces, it's really challenging, I think, to come back from. I think our, our co-host here might be able to commiserate with me on that one. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, that, that's, I think that's mostly it. Yes. Uh, it's super challenging for a sisters player to go into the Tau double bomber list. I think. Yeah, you just because you can't really hide your stuff. If you had to key, if you had to key on one moment, like the one thing that you would do different if you were going to go back hindsight twenty twenty and replay this game, what would be the big point that you think you'd uh, kind of uh, focus on? Well, I think this is where um, being new to player place terrain uh, kind of bit me in the butt. Um, it was it was as simple as. I'm pointing my terrain one direction, and really what it needed to be is just 30 degrees, uh, you know, changed, um, rotated. And I think that just by doing that, you you just get a lot more coverage from what you're trying to yep. do. And, and um, you know, 
you're getting, you know, experience and, you know, stacking your terrain pieces and shutting off, um, lines of sight that way. Um, and not, you know, I, I had it turned one way thinking I needed that wall there to, to cover the line of sight from one direction, but really I had my other piece that was serving that purpose. And so I had the freedom to rotate it just a little bit more and cover this other angle. And so it, you know, it can really come down to, I think just a, a really nuanced placement. And I think that doing a little bit of a better job at pre-measuring my lines of sight, pre-measuring where he was able to move. I think that I, I could have, I don't know that it would have changed the outcome of the game, but I think I could have uh, protected my resources a little bit better from his alpha strike. And, you know, after his turn one, you know, his bombers went down, that's fine. But I think um, I just wasn't going to have enough resources left to um, put up with his firepower. The um, That's a good point you make there. One thing that people don't think about when you think about a ruin, even if it's a square, if you turn it to where the point is facing the direction you want to block, you actually have that high pot. Uh, what is it? The how is the high pot news? What is that right? I'm from Arkansas. So. I don't know things. I, know, I know what you mean. The, yeah, the yeah, big, yeah. The big length, the longest, the, big, the, the longest the, line possible. Yeah. It's been a while since I've, I've even thought about trigonometry, but you know what I'm saying. But uh, yeah. that that big long edge is actually what blocks that angle. So you actually get a ton more surface to to block an angle if you turn it with the point facing the direction you want to go. That's that's a great yeah. point to touch on there. Yeah. And I think that's that's probably and you know when I think about my my last two GTs you know one was Glass City one was Cleveland and when I think about the thing it, you know like these models they they all serve one purpose right my retributors are going to shoot something my retention are going to fight something and but they're only going to do what they're going to do when you move them in that location and everything is going to come down to movement um, yes I can put this buff on that piece or you know I mean I need to spend the CP for this this stratagem but. I think that once you master the movement phase, and b- by no means am I a master, and that's not what I'm trying to say, but I think mastering the movement phase and getting the pieces of the board in the position you want them to be in, then they're just going to roll the dice that you need them to. When I think about the the two games that I lost, one was, you know, being, I needed to be extra careful with putting that terrain piece down. I need to be extra careful with pre-measuring his movement and his his lines of sight. And you can see, I think, you know, from the beginning, from his turn one, how it's going to go turn by turn, who's going to trade where. And I think, you know, my my game against Brad Chester in in Cleveland was the same idea. I, could, I realized there was a folly in deployment and there's a domino. And I think just mastering the positioning of your units and your terrain is really, I think, what it comes down to a lot of the times. And it, it, it could be like a, a really nuanced mistake that could lose you the game in that scenario. I yep. think. 100%, especially against players like that. Yeah, um, no capitalize on it for sure, and I think that's what I'm still learning. Over the course of the weekend, uh, what unit was your MVP, and uh, what units on the chopping block? Oh my gosh, I had so much fun with the Bonk Mata. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this lady, but she slaps. Let me, and she's I think one of the few pieces in the game that is going to fight three times if she fights on death. So. Um, She's 65 points. She costs two CP. What you do is you give her chapel of the sacrifice. That's a relic. So um, she can use an epic deed stratagem once per game to cost zero. The epic deed stratagem that you're going to use for her is the one that automatically passes her him. And the him that you give her is, uh, let's see here. What's it called? Can't look. I can't find it here. Anyway, it's um, Psalm of Righteous Smiting, I think. So you give her one plus one strength, plus one attack. You improve the armor penetration by one. And then I think the, the wording of this is, is key. At the end of the fight phase, if the priest model is an engagement range of any enemy units, it can fight one additional time. So you've got that. And then the Chaplet of Sacrifice, in addition to passing the, the epic D stratagem to automatically pass that him, it says, um, when the bearer is destroyed, do not remove that model from play. At the end of the phase, it can either shoot as if you're a shooting phase or fight as if it were your fight phase. So um, what you do is you, you go in, you charge with her, you swing with her attacks. And if your opponent swings back and kills her, I mean, she's toughness three, four wounds, three up armor save, she'll go down pretty easy. But if your opponent kills her, both of you, she's not removed from play and she stays right where she is as written. And then both of those fight agains trigger at end of phase. So it, be, my be, it being my turn, I can choose the, the, um, the timing of those two effects. So you actually fight with Psalm of Righteous Smiting and then you fight on death. So she actually fights three, te- three times. She's like, she's like, as uh, James Shapiro, another uh, sister player over in the UK said, 
she's like six for Pencha in a trench coat. And she just, <laughs> she's loud. <laughs> she's That's not- awesome. She's really cool, man. I I, um, I play a lot with the the team Australia Sisters player from from this year. It's like his sort of primary army, and we tested a lot of different sisters lists before WTC this year. And this never came up. This is really really cool. It's like sisters are an army that have been, I'll say, so good for so long. Like they're obviously not in the best place right now, but they've been they're you know, really competitive for quite a long time. And it's interesting. There's still like there's still tech I don't know about that people are figuring out. I think that's really really cool. Yeah, that's cool. I like yeah. it. Yeah, she um, you know, game one, she she kills three um three Votan bikes and then piles into a land fortress and moves block it moves blocks it for a turn. Um game two, uh she killed a squad of berserkers, uh Votan berserkers and a and a couple of troops. Game three, she killed oh, well that was Tom, so she didn't do much that turn. Game four, I think she killed four raveners, four or five, six raveners, something like that. And then game seven, she's like pretty much killed a squad of Scorpac destroyers. So she, sorry, game five. Um, she just, she does some really surprising damage. And I think, you know, you tell people, hey, listen, I've got this rhino. There's a, there's a dogmata in it. She, she can do a lot of damage. And this rhino is going to move 12 inches if I go first. And they're like, yeah, okay, it's just dogmata or it's just some sacrosense. I'll be fine. And then I think a lot of people are surprised when, when she steps out and she advances and charges and, and, and it hits real hard. Matt, I think yeah. your uh, the the question that you were supposed to steal was that question. By the way, that's that's the stealing question. Oh, the MVP unit is it? Oh yeah, you got to ask it. You got to beat me to it. It's you're, it's you're, a race. Matt, you're, you're never asking that one again. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I'm never asking again. Oh, we'll see, man. You never. I'm tricky. I'm tricky with it. Um, um, that, that, that's really cool, man. I, I think I think what you sort of touched on there at the end is also really interesting, right? A lot of people will expect you to put Repentia or Retributors in that Rhino, and like that's kind of the known trick, right? But when you do something that's a little bit out of the ordinary, I don't know, people's respect for it suddenly just drops off a little bit, you know? Like people are like, oh, well, it's not Repentia, it's not Retributors, I don't really need to worry about the reach. Um, and sometimes that's better than just like, like, like arbitrarily, like having a unit of Repentia is probably better, right? A unit of Repentia probably does more stuff over the course of the game, moving into the center, getting out, charging and, and smashing something. But it doesn't do more if your opponent respects that and screens properly. But if your opponent doesn't respect it and screen and you get in with this character and you have Sacrosance and you have a unit of Crusaders that are just going to stand on an objective somewhere and score you some points, you actually get more value with what is essentially a lower value unit and you preserve their attention to use them later on in the game also. So like, yep. I think it's pretty cool, man. Yeah. And I, you know, I never, I never actually took her to a tournament before, but I was like, you know, this is my last round with Nephilim. She's, she's really cool. She's quirky. I'm just going to run her. And boy, was I, I, I was really happy with her performance. So she did a great job. Nice. Yeah, great, well, well, thanks for coming on part one, Scott. We're going to jump into part two here and I'm going to name the part two, the, the solely slice. Um, I feel like that's appropriate. <laughs> Excellent. But uh, before we go, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about there's a there's a GoFundMe right now for one of the Death of Glory members. And could you tell us I'm going to link it down in the bottom. So for those listening, uh, check the show notes down there. But um, Scott, tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Brock is not a close friend of mine or anything. And actually, just recently I joined the team. Um, But awful thing happened the other night. Um, His house burned down in the fire. Um, and he lost everything he owns as well as he lost his three dogs. Um, so he has gone through this devastating experience. Um, they uh, the death or glory team is really coming together and trying to support him as best they can. Um, getting him anything from toiletries to clothes, to a place to stay, to something to keep his mind off everything that he's gone through. You know, I think, uh, <laughs> some of the guys are helping him, uh, restart his wall and buying him some orcs, um, but uh, we would really, really, really appreciate any support you guys would be able to offer for this um, awful thing that uh, Brock has gone through. So we yeah, really appreciate you, anything you can get. Yeah, what I heard, that's just absolutely devastating. I can't imagine uh, losing losing my dogs. I mean, that's awful to have that happen to okay. you. And uh, check out the show notes down below. You'll see the, you'll see the link for that uh, GoFundMe. So check that out. And um, thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure to check us out on Patreon now. That's the Competitive 40K Network on Patreon. It'll be me and Nick Natavati's The Art of War Vanilla. And make sure to check out The Art of War Down Under with the late and great Adam Camo Larry. Thanks for listening. Join us for part two. 
Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.